Good morning. Today's reading is Luke 10, 21 through 24. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to the little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. So be it. Okay, so I need you to remind me, we did not do prayer and announcements, praise, so we'll do that at the end of service, so remind me, and also remind me, I want to get us together and do a video, quick little five second video, that's it, so that I can send it to Beth in Romania and tell her Merry Christmas, okay? All right, but right now you got to listen to me and bear with me for a few minutes, or longer. So I entitled this, Do This and You Will Live. So let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for the time that we can come together. We thank you for the blessing and heritage that you give us in our children and grandchildren. Lord, help us to take seriously training them up in the ways of righteousness, Lord. Not to be hypocritical, but to live like Jesus in this world. To build that ark so that our children see our faith and enter in into the ark, which is Jesus Christ. Father, we do thank you and praise you as we go into this time of Christmas season where we can spend more time with family and friends. Help us to be aware of the needs out there in this world and, and to give as you have given to us, Lord, uh, out of a kind heart, out of the abundance we have, not just out of, um, and even out of the poverty that we have, not just out of clearing out our pantry or things like that, Lord, but to give with a good heart because of the grace upon grace that you've given us. Open our ears to hear your word, Father, and apply it to our lives so we may be guided by the Spirit into all truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So do this and you will live. And scripture was from Luke 10, verse 21 to 24. I'm going to do a little reviewing first, and the reason I am is to set up this orderly account that Luke read uh, or wrote. Last week, I asked you the question, who do you say that I am? Because that's the point you got to by Luke chapter 9. You've got to figure out who Jesus is. Is, is he just what the crowd say, just this wonderful prophet, and he can do these things for me? Let's take, take our friends to Jesus, even if we have faith, and he can heal them? Or is he the Messiah, the chosen one, the Son of God? Is he the King of kings and Lord of lords? How would Jesus be viewed, and how is he viewed in this world today? as a good prophet, as a good moral teacher, as a legend. There's so many things. But who is he to you? And how are you living a life that tells others that? I talked about the difference in believing and what faith is and how Luke talk has, has talked about that several times up to this point and talked about your task if you have accepted the call to be Jesus' disciple. Jesus doesn't ask anybody if they want to be saved or anything. He gets asked the question, how must I, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But he says, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to be my disciple, because it was given, you either accepted Jesus for he, who he was, or you didn't. You were either with him or you were against him. And if you accepted him, then you gave up everything else to follow after and train after your Lord and Savior so that you would be like him in this world. And you didn't understand that at all. And we still don't understand a lot of it today. But we're guided each and every step by the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus said, I will never forsake you. I will always be with you. After Peter's declaration of who Jesus was... Jesus foretold of his coming, suffering, and death. That's the next thing that Jesus says. Because Jesus came, remember that when we're celebrating Christmas, it's the mass of Christ, the death of Christ. Jesus came specifically to die for our sins. 
to pay the penalty, to pay the price. One payment forever for everyone, for every sin period. Nothing else needed, do you believe? And if you believe, you also have the power now to live a life free, not only of the penalty of sin, but the power of sin, as you let the power of God reside in you in His form of the Holy Spirit, God Himself living in His people. But are you willing to follow Jesus? What does that taking up the cross mean, that suffering and dying and giving up the world to follow after Him? Do you trust Him enough to give Him everything? So in Luke 9, verse 23 to 27, Jesus said to all of them, everyone there, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world, yet lose or forfeit his very self or his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and of my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his holy angels and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truthfully, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Jesus is clear about the cost and he is clear about the rewards. Jesus will come back. He will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords and you will either be with him or you'll be separated from His presence forever. The other nine disciples couldn't cast out the demons. Remember that? Because James, John, and Peter were up on the mountain. They caught a glimpse of Jesus' future glory, this transfiguration. We don't know what we'll be like, but Paul says it will be changed. It will be different. We have some glimpses of that in Jesus' uh, presence after His uh, death and before He ascended and everything, but we don't know exactly what that's like. But while they were, those were on the mountaintop down in the valley low, the church was asked by the Father, hey, will you get rid of this demon out of my child? Because that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be like Jesus. But they couldn't, and later they asked, and I'm not sure if that's in Luke or which gospel it's in, they asked why couldn't we do it, and he said, you know, you need to pray more. But what he said at this point when Luke 9, 41 was, oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, how long must I remain with you and put up with you? Do you believe? All you need is childlike faith and then let God take you to maturity through the reading of His Word, through gathering together in fellowship, through prayer, through guidance by the Holy Spirit so that you accept the gifts of the Spirit, walk in step with the Spirit. You are a new creation in Christ the minute that you become saved. But you do have to mature, don't you? And that takes that continual denial and taking up your cross and following after Jesus. So I believe, Lord, but help my unbelief. Something that I say quite often because I find myself doubting and I know what God's Word says and everything, but I find myself lacking that faith and I have to get on my knees and say, Lord, increase my faith. Jesus then tells of His suffering and death again if you didn't notice that from Scripture. And he tells those who want to listen how to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It's not wrong to want things. It's wrong to covet things, yes. But it's not wrong to want things. It's not wrong to want to be great. Jesus told us exactly how to be. To give up in this world so that you will be great in the kingdom of heaven. Not to build up treasures here on earth, but build up treasures in heaven. He never tells you not to do that. He tells you to do it with a spiritual mindset, thinking of God's kingdom first instead of your kingdom and, and doing the things to build up the kingdom of heaven. Jesus' time is approaching, so He resolutely, as I think my scripture said, sets out for Jerusalem. He's ready to go because it's His time. And He has to go through Samaria. You've got to have a little insight to know what that is. And yeah, we're getting up to the story of the Good Samaritan, aren't we? And I, no way I'm going to miss that one. <laughs> but he has to go through Samaria, that region between Galilee and, and Judah. And, he, and they have to go through where their half-breed brothers and sisters are that have gone in this half-pagan, half-God religion, and they're just the scum of the earth. They've even written into their laws, the man-made laws, that you don't deal with the Samaritans at all. They're nothing of any value whatsoever. But weren't we all created in God's image? But this is how they treated the Samaritans at that time. 
And as they go, Jesus sends out 70, 72, whatever your scripture says, and they go out and they perform miracles. And they even cast out demons. Wow. But Jesus tells them, don't celebrate and don't have joy because you cast out demons. Be joyful that your name is written in heaven. But James and John even asked Jesus in verse 54, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? We think with our newfound status that we'll just call down fire out of heaven to, to destroy these people, those people. Oh, don't tell me you don't know any of those people in your mind that you ever thought that. Be careful how you stand. Make sure your faith is where it's supposed to be. Make sure that you're not judgmental, but you're merciful and kind and loving. Because it was by grace you were saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by any of your works of righteousness. Your righteousness is filthy rags, but you've been covered by the righteousness of Jesus forever and ever. And as Kara read, nothing will separate us from God's love. So Luke wrote this orderly account to tell us what's going on. I want to back up just a little bit further and mention that at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, he had his temptation first in the wilderness, and, the, and he answered the devil this way. This is my paraphrase. Luke 4, 4. Consume the word of God for nourishment. Are you doing that? Luke 4, 8. Worship God and serve him only. No other idols, no other loves. Luke 4, 12. <laughs> Don't put God to the test. That's how Jesus answered the devil, and then he started his public ministry, and I look back at that to, to look at my ministry of how I am serving and look at these things and say, am I consuming God's Word constantly as nourishment? Am I living off the bread of life as much as I... Oh, I overate last night. <sighs> Do I consume that much of God's Word? It's your spiritual nourishment. Do I worship God only or are there other things that I have these loves that compete with Him and I can't do the service for Him because of these things? Even good things. Do I put my God to the test? As they did in the wilderness, Paul says, and many of them were destroyed, consumed. Hmm. What about how I live? What about, of course, how, what Jesus taught and how He lived? The very words that Jesus spoke when He started His ministry in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19 is, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and, set, and recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So now I have to examine myself even further and say, not only am I doing my own Bible study and everything else, is it, is it seen in my life? And am I living a life that brings about justice, tells about God, fights the, these dis discrimination and everything else in this world? Because all you've got to do is look on Facebook or, or look at the news and look how terrible this world is becoming and how far and far God is from any of them. And they still have skewed visions of who they think Jesus Christ is. You go out and ask people, and they, they still have an opinion of Jesus Christ. So how are you living and telling so that you can counteract those false teachings? As soon as Jesus said these words, he had opposition. He had opposition in the church first, if you read back in Luke 4, and then with demons, because everybody wants to stop this. They want to stop the advancement of the gospel. The good news that salvation has come to man. After the exorcism, Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law, and what did she do? Scripture doesn't even talk much here. It just says she was sick, she got healed, and then she served them. You notice that? I mean, wait a minute, what all happened? Doesn't matter. She was healed, and she began to serve. Then more demons were cast out. And in verse 41 of Luke 4, they shouted, You are the Son of God. The demons know, and they even tremble. What about you? Is Jesus your everything? Is He not just your Savior, because you said the prayer and everything? Is He Lord of all in your life? 
In Luke chapter 5, Jesus cries out to fishermen and, and he says, listen to me and you'll catch fish. And they thought to themselves, probably, I'm putting this in there again, why would we listen to you? We're fishermen. But he's trying to teach them something so much more with the physical to show the spiritual. And they listened, obeyed him, and were amazed that they caught fish because they had been catching fish all day. And he said, you don't get the point. Luke 5, verse 10, don't be afraid, he said to Simon. From now on you will catch men. Do you see this pattern which Luke is building up here? Do you understand where you fit into this story? Those who have faith bring a paralyzed man to Jesus for healing. What does Jesus do? He forgives the man of his sins. Then he heals him. Wow. What did the, what did the crowds expect? They expected a healing. Forgiveness of sins? You can do that? Well, wait a minute. Did I even want that? Because if I want that, that means my life is not my own anymore. I've been bought with a price. I've got to live for His kingdom and His will and His glory. I've got to even wrong daily bread if that's what it is to do that. But when Jesus, verse 5, Luke 5, verse 20, when He saw their faith, He said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. Who do you say that Jesus is? Increase my faith. Don't let me limit your work on earth through me. Increase my faith. Jesus healed many people. He doesn't want us under the curse of sin. He wants us to live free and apart from that. Scripture even teaches that some of us may have sins or, or physical ailments and stuff because we've kind of walked away from the faith. And I don't want to, that's a totally different topic, so I don't want to go that far down that road. But we also just live in a fallen world, and sin happens. The results and casualties of sin in a fallen world are there, and we have to live in this world and be a light in this world until Jesus comes. And it takes faith. And so many times we try to do things our own way rather than relying on God and knowing what He wants us to do. What is greater? That people are healed of their infirmities where they don't have to suffer in this world or that their sins are forgiven forever for all eternity? I don't think the men that brought, Jesus, that brought the man to Jesus that day expected, neither did the crowd, they expected a healing and they got so much more. Did they realize it? Then Jesus calls a rich man to follow him, and Matthew leaves his tax collector's booth and follows him and never looks back. What does the world say? Oh, he eats with sinners and tax collectors. In chapter 6, Jesus heals on the Sabbath. Oh, no, not that day, right? <laughs> but wouldn't you pull your animal out of a ditch if they fell in the, on that day? but you don't want to heal people and you certainly don't want their sins forgiven for them to find, oh, the Sabbath, rest for your souls for all eternity if your sins are forgiven. Blessed are you if you realize this and give up this world. Blessed are you when people reject you and you suffer even in this world for Jesus. Blessed are you and great is your reward in heaven. But there's woes there too, aren't there? Then Jesus teaches to love and to do good to everyone. Don't be judgmental or you'll never do this. <laughs> love everyone, even your enemies. Oh, I'm kind of, I kind of get it a little bit. Build a house on a firm foundation so that when the storms of life come, you won't be blown away. Luke chapter 7, more about faith and who Jesus is. And then at a home of a Pharisee one who knew the law and everything, who thought they were in a right standing with God, this sinful, scandalous woman comes in and worships at the feet of Jesus. Maybe we ought to stop and do that more. Jesus tells her that her debt has been paid in full. He says in verse 48, Your sins are forgiven. Oh, I've been concentrating on the miracles I've seen thus far and the demon exorcisms and stuff. Oh, your sins are forgiven. 
And Jesus told the woman in verse 50, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, it doesn't mean go and keep sinning. That means your sins have been forgiven. The penalty has been paid. Now, live by the power of the Spirit so that you can live and not have sin control your life. But you can live for God like you were created in the beginning to give Him glory and thanks all the time, to praise and to do good for all of God's children. Luke 8, don't you realize that the farmer has come to sow his seed? Well, where is the seed fallen? In your heart. Uh, even a child again knows that a farmer plants seed is to grow a crop. So are you producing? Don't worry about how much, just are you producing? Because the father will prune as he needs to. The gardener will prune as he needs to, to produce more fruit. But you've got to have that heart that's receptive. You've got to have your mind changed and renewed so that you can be used for the kingdom of God, so that you can be like Jesus Christ in this world. Who would light a lamp and then hide it? No one would. That's just silly. Luke chapter 9, then. Who does the world say that I am? No, that's not the question. Who do you say I am? This is where Luke is going. For you to deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow after Jesus. Because at the end of that chapter, Jesus says, Foxes have dens and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Follow me, let the dead bury their own dead. You, however, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And no one who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Have you made that commitment yet of who Jesus Christ is? Have you professed that He is the Messiah, the Christ, the chosen one of God, the way, the truth, and the life? Because if you have, then you either commit to following Him or you don't. You can still admit who He is and never accept Him as Savior and Lord. Do you? If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Luke chapter 10, the 70 to 72 go out, and I say that because it can be translated differently. But anyway, a lot, of, lot more than 12 go out. 70, 70 plus. Jesus tells them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Few answer that call because that cost is tough. I don't have a place to lay my head. I don't have time to bury my dead. And how many times have I looked back longingly at the world? The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest. Many will profess, say, Lord, Lord, we cast out demons in your name. And he'll say, depart from me, I don't know you. Those, were who, those who were obedient and went out came back rejoicing that demons obeyed them. Wow, that is something. But Jesus said in verse 20 of Luke 10, Do not rejoice that spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Do you understand what Luke is writing here? Are you just reading it, or are you reading it so that it will change your life? Is it just a story? Is it something that is just made up? There's so much historical fact, archaeology, everything else that can prove, but that doesn't change how you feel in your heart again. Do you believe that God loves you so much that He gave His one and only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life? Do you? Because if you do, you're changed. You're a new creation. And you prove to me your faith without your works. I'll prove to you my faith by my works. Not that they're saving works, but they're saving grace working through me that I cannot see somebody on the road that has been beaten and left for dead and not help him, even if he's a rotten, stinking Jew <laughs> in this case. He's not a Samaritan. We'll get there in a second. Luke 10, verse 21 to 24. At this time, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and declared... That verb there, or let's see, yeah, it would be a verb. I didn't look to see what context it was. Rejoiced is what the disciples did when they came back. Can you imagine if you went out and you had these fears and, and apprehensions and, and expectations and whatever they were, and you came back and you said, hey, 
I was over there and this demon came out. Hey, I did the same thing. Can you imagine the excitement that they had? Knowing that, that, that God had come to earth through Jesus Christ, people were healed, everything else, but Jesus said, wait a minute. Don't rejoice for that reason. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And then, at that time, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit from God directly to Jesus in the flesh. And Jesus declared, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Man, that verse is so important. All you need is that childlike faith. All of your religious uh, training and everything means nothing compared to childlike faith just accepting Jesus for who he says he is. We're back to the little child again that I can pick up in my arms and throw up in the air. He doesn't say, no, Dad, you'll drop me. He says, woo! Because he's having the time of his life. Yes, Father, for this is well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been entrusted to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Do you know the Father through the Son? Because if you do know who Jesus is, then you know God as your heavenly Father. And you can cry out to Him through the Spirit, Daddy. Wow. What a story that we have to tell. A life that we need to live so that people believe our story. So that our children, our grandchildren, our friends, our neighbors, even our enemies. Verse 23, Then Jesus turned to the disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. So Jesus tells everyone that they just need to come to him with childlike faith. And that what's important here is that your sins have been forgiven and your names are written in heaven. But then he tells those that are following him, he said, blessed are your eyes, for you see. Blessed are your ears, for you hear. Because you hear and obey, you see and you do. Prophets and kings of the Old Testament. Let me think who they are. They dreamed of this day that you have seen in a reality. Because Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Wow. And all you need is childlike faith to be born from above. But then, of course, you need to grow into maturity to be like Christ. Hmm, what would the church look like if they lived that way? Oh, Luke wrote about it in Acts chapter 2, didn't he? How does the church look today? Have we been sidetracked? Are we living the way that we should? So we come to Jesus' second parable in the Gospel of Luke. Maybe you noticed that, maybe you didn't. It's only the second parable so far. And we're ten chapters in. First parable was what? The farmer and the seed. Okay, this starts it off. God came to plant his seed, the Word. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. This is a fact. So what do we need to do next? Hmm, we need to live like this good Samaritan, which it's not entitled, but that's the point that it's trying to get to. And this parable gets taken way out of context so many times, and that's okay, but learn the, the true meaning of it. The farmer went out to plant his seed, and now Jesus tells a parable about how to show compassion and mercy even to those that you don't want to show it to. And he shows it through a person who shouldn't have known how to really give it, but did. Because it's our nature, again, from God is created in his image to be merciful and loving and kind because God is to us. So we call this the parable the Good Samaritan. And when you say that, what do you think of? You've got some prejudices, some predetermined decisions about it. And you probably think of some things like Samaritan Purse and other things like that that's, that have spawned kind of off of this. The Good Samaritan. What do you think of? I think of, like I said, as, as the rotten scoundrel 
showing Christ's love better than anybody. But let's look at it. First of all, what are parables? They're further teaching illustrations. They, they are teaching illustrations that people were familiar with with the day, and they were teaching illustrations that would draw you to salvation and then draw you into maturity if you have come to salvation so that you know what the kingdom of heaven is like. Again, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. So the purpose is for you to know Jesus and to grow in Jesus. Okay? <clears throat> People try to stamp out all the injustices in the world and say that that's what we need to do from this parable. That's a good message, but that's not the case. Non-believers use it to evaluate believers. Well, you're not acting very much like the Good Samaritan. They don't even know what that necessarily means. But they know in your behavior you didn't act like they thought you would act. Did you act the way you should? Maybe you did. Maybe they just didn't like your answer. Jesus had just told his disciples, the ones who left, the, that left this, uh, him and went out into Samaria to leave the world behind and to go do the things of the kingdom of God. They took up, they denied themselves, took up their cross and followed Jesus, followed in his training and teaching. And they came back joyful, but kind of with the wrong reasons. They only saw the physical, not the spiritual. They saw the here and now, not the eternal. We cast out demons and people were healed. Good thing. But the thing is, is that your names are written in heaven. And hopefully by what you did, others' names will be written in heaven. Because you were a light to them. You were salt to the earth. They were spreading the message to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Forgiveness of sins to sinners rejoicing that their name is written in heaven have the mysteries of God been revealed to you can you really say that you have faith is your faith being put into action if you believe and you are producing therefore you are seeing and hearing and blessed are you because you're in a right standing with God. One day, verse 25, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Now this isn't a lawyer like we think of today. This was a lawyer that studied the Old Testament scriptures and he knew how to relate them to the people. But did that mean that what he related to the people was correct? <laughs> No, because that's why there was such hypocrisy in the Pharisees and Samaritans and the scribes and everything else. Because they had written so much into the law because they were self-centered that it helped them abide by the law more and kind of leave commonplace out of even being able to upkeep the law because they were better than. Wow, that's not like Christ or like God at all, is it? And there were so many misinterpretations there. Moses allowed you to do this because this. Well, he knew the law. So he said, teacher, teach me. You're the teacher. We don't know where you came from, your background. I've got all these degrees and everything that I have. What must I do to inherit eternal life? That's the most important question there is to anyone, especially as we get closer to our deathbed. What's going to happen next? Will I live? Will I die? Is there a place of heaven or a place of hell? And so much thought process there, and so much thought process of how Jesus fits in with that. But Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Well, here's what Jesus told the man. He said, what is written in the law? And then how do you read it? Well, I know what's written in here. You do too. You might not know all of it. You might have read it through 10,000 10, times. But you know what's in here. But over here, how do you interpret it? <laughs> how do you interpret that love your enemy? Okay? What is written in the law and how do you read it? The man answered. He might have heard Jesus teach this before. He might not have. He might have just knew this in his head. 
but not in his heart because that's obvious. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength, and with all your mind. And as you know this, again, this was not only the prayer of the religious elite, this was the prayer of every Jew, every Israelite. They prayed this daily. And love your neighbor as yourself. You won't find them in the same place in the Old Testament. You'll find them in two different places. But he put that together just like Jesus had before. You're, 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 all the law can be put together with love God, love others, with everything. So he has the right answer in his head, right? Jesus says in verse 28, you have answered correctly. I know what's written in here, and I answered correctly. I know this says, love my enemies. Do this and you'll live. Uh-oh, that's a little harder, isn't it? This is my interpretation again and what I'm doing and what I'm willing to do, the cost involved, the suffering involved, the time involved, the money involved. Oh, we see all this in this parable that goes through that we're going to read. Verse 29, but wanting to justify himself. Is that not what I do sometimes? When I say again, I know I'm supposed to love my enemy, but oh, today I don't have time. Oh, that person just really gets on my nerves. Oh, whatever the reason is. Wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, then who is my neighbor? Okay, this is a religious lawyer of the Old Testament. He knows exactly who his neighbor is. He knows exactly why you leave a portion of your crops. He knows exactly why you release people from their debts. The year of Jubilee, everything else that you may or may not know. And you don't have to know all these. All you have to have is childlike faith. But he knows all of these things. He knows who his neighbor is. But he has twisted the law so much that he thinks only his neighbor is his fellow Jew. And his neighbor really is the other Pharisees and scribes and stuff that live on his block and are Jews. Hmm. I need to examine my own life again and see where I stand in this parable. <clears throat> Jesus took up the question and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hand of the robbers. Okay, you need to know a little bit. But this is a place where you go literally down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Not the old Jericho. It was wiped out. Remember Joshua did the battle of Jericho. Jericho and the walls fell down. Okay. <laughs> but this is Jericho now. And there's hills and things where you go down. And robbers can get in there. And the Levi and the priest probably were coming back from services in Jerusalem and going back to where they stayed. Who knows? This is a story. This is a parable. But a Jewish man, based off of this, is implied, not a Samaritan, was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell in the hands of robbers. Nothing he did on his own. Cause you, so you can't say, oh, my enemy here, if you wouldn't have got drunk last night, that wouldn't have happened to you. No, nothing on his own, so we can't point fingers. It just happened. They stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. That means he's naked, laying on the side of the road, beaten, bloody, probably can't do much to speak other than cry out, help me. Okay? Would you not want to have compassion on somebody like that? Even sinners do certain things. Why should you get credit? Oh, yeah, that's a different Bible verse again, but that's okay. Nothing he did, and he really was in need. So you can't say he just got that sign out there on the side of the road saying he needs feed, and if he'd get rid of the three dogs beside of him, he'd have food. Okay, you can't say that. This man had a need. Now by chance, no divine reason, a priest was going down the same road, but when he saw him, he passed on the other side. That's a guy I would expect to help, right? Right? So too, when a Levite came to that spot and saw him, he passed on the other side. What was different there? We got the priest, so we got the pastor of the church. Then we got the Levite, we got the youth director of the church. I'm just making up these titles, okay? And the youth director at least saw him. Um, I don't think, mine has saw him both here, but I don't think the original text, don't count me wrong as I don't have it in front of me. I'm, you might hit me on it. Um, the priest didn't even give him a glance. The Levite at least looked, but then said in his heart whatever he said. I don't have time for this, you rotten Samaritan. I'm correct, aren't I? Okay. 
think I am. If I'm wrong, come later and we'll talk more. And he passed on the other side. Now here's where you're at in the story, and you've got to remember that you're here in that day, and here's what you expect. Then a Samaritan came up. Where is this story going? Because I'm not expecting the Samaritan to help at all. I don't know what's going on in this story. I don't know why the two good guys didn't help. But the Samaritan? Because he's a scoundrel. We all know that. He's a scoundrel. Okay? <clears throat> but when a Samaritan on a journey, he's got a place he's got to go. He might not just be going home. He might have a further distance. Maybe he does, doesn't. Came upon him. He looked at him and had compassion. There's the key. Didn't matter who he was. He had a need. And he could help that man's need. And this was a need, so you can't argue that or anything else. So he didn't care who he was, if he was his enemy or anything else. He went to him, bandaged his wound, poured on oil and um, wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Now, we could go in each of these things and talk about what they are, but this is a parable. It's a further teaching illustration. It's not a real story of what happened, so we don't need to know where the priest was going or where he came from or the Levite. We need to understand the moral of the story and the questions asked. The question asked was, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Before that, Jesus already said to his disciples, blessed are your eyes because you see and hear. So now he's teaching this story saying to me as a disciple, oh boy, I better see and hear this because my mindset is, yeah, as Jews, we do have an advantage. And Paul says you do, but it, he explains that. But none are righteous, no, not one. And Jesus Christ came to give salvation to all mankind. And, oh yeah, that guy, oh, he's a, a child of God also. And I need to love him. And maybe if I love him more and give up more of my own, maybe he'll see Christ in me. And Samaritan didn't even know this again. And these things took him most of the day to do. While he walked us alongside, while he poured out his oil, his wine, and he took care of him. Verse 35, the next day, so he was still there. How many times would you, when you're on your journey to somewhere, I'm going to Hawaii, I like going there. I'm going to the airport, and I see a man in need, and it's going to cost me my flight, my trip. And then I'm going to pour, pour out the money that might cost me also. Would you do that, or would that be the stopping factor for grace upon grace upon grace? The next day he took out two denarii. That's two days' wages, or two silver coins, yours might say. A denarii would buy about 25 to 30 people's meals. He took out two of them. 60 meals to get him a place to stay. He gave it to the innkeeper, said, take care of him. And on my return, I will pay you for any additional expense. He just said, I will write an open check. So then we get to the point. Which of the, these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? Well, I didn't see this story going this way, did you? especially with the Samaritan. Now I'm trapped in my religious hypocrisy. What in the world am I going to say? Well, the man answered, he said, the one who showed him mercy. What does Jesus say? Go and do likewise. Now you can take the good Samaritan all over the place all you want to, and like I said, as Christians, you get nailed with it for your behavior. You can take it out to helping fight hunger in the world, but it's a personal thing here. Do you realize you've been blessed because your eyes see and your ears hear that you're a child of God and He has sent you out and there are a few workers out there, but the harvest is great? Do you understand this? Go and show compassion. You understand God's Word. Don't try to interpret it on your own. Interpret it through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, to live a life like Christ in this world. Will you do that? You know to love your God and love your neighbor. You know who your neighbor is. But do you do it? There is the difference. What about your judgmentalism? What about what it will cost you, the inconvenience, the time, the money, everything else? What if those things mattered to Jesus when He died for your sins? 
Do this and live. What was the question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Again, I can't do anything. It's by grace. But if I had been given grace, would I not want to be gracious? If I had been given mercy, would I not want to be merciful? Have your eyes seen and your ears heard who Jesus is? What about your neighbor? Will you tell of His love this Christmas season and show mercy even to those who don't deserve it? Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit. We thank you that Jesus Christ came and dwelled in the flesh and lived among us and that he taught us the way. Lord, help us to not make excuses, but to live like Christ in this world, knowing that he will not, never forsake us, knowing that the spirit lives inside of us, guiding us into all truth, revealing to us everything that Jesus has taught us, knowing that also, as Kira said, that nothing can separate us from God's love, that if we believe in faith in Jesus Christ, we do have eternal life. Our names are written in heaven. May we rejoice constantly. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You want me to do that before we sing? Okay, I'm going to do announcement stuff before we sing. Verla, will you stay here first and let me get everybody to you?